Okay, so uh, thanks for hanging in. We got the last word goes to our honored professor for the last time, Dr. Keith Wapner. Right, we gotta congratulate the people that hung in all this time. So, Cavus Foot, so a little bit of a change. Um, what I do and when I do it, uh, these I think are pretty fascinating cases usually. A lot of times associated with neuromuscular disease. The first thing you got is define and figure out whether it's a forefoot cavus or whether it's a hindfoot cavus or whether it's a global cavus. And you really have to address each component of that cavus deformity in order to really be able to correct what you're dealing with. Forefoot varus and valgus is really critical and you have to figure out whether these are flexible or are, uh, um, fixed deformities because that's what drives it. We all know about the Coleman block test. Uh, we figure out does it correct when you put them on the Coleman block or does it not correct? And that's gonna be important because if it's flexible, um, you can think about tendon transfers. If it's not flexible, you're going to have to think about osteotomies and fusions, and that's how you define it. Um, a lot of the times if we get CTs on them, these uh, 3D reconstructions are pretty cool. Um, they don't necessarily help you, but they're kind of fun to look at and manipulate. So what about the forefoot? Well, you got plantar flexion of one or more metatarsals, and you get adduction of the foot. Uh, at the MTP joint, a lot of times you can get claw toe deformities. They can be flexible, they can be severe, and you get hyperextension, especially the great toe, and you have to address that. In the midfoot, a lot of times the plantar fascia becomes contracted, and that contributes to your forefoot adduction, and it can also incre increase your calcaneal inversion. And in the hind foot, that calcaneal varus can lead to subtalar instability. It can lead to ankle instability. Um, so you have to look at both those joints in conjunction and figure out what's driving it. Um, this is what you see oftentimes patient comes in and basically they're just walking on the lateral side of their calcaneus. Um, they've blown out the perineals, they've blown out their lateral collateral ligaments. Um, you can see the degree of virus uh, in their heel and how that's driving the forefoot and the complications associated with it. So your goal is to get a stable plantar grade foot. If they're flexible, it's a combination of soft tissue releases, tendon transfers, because you have to balance things. If you don't balance them, you're going to get recurrence and often extra articular osteotomies in order to achieve that. If it's rigid, you're going to be doing soft tissue releases, but if it's rigid, you're going to be doing articular osteotomies and fusions because you have to get things stable, but you also have to think about balancing. So on the forefoot, we usually start first with a plantar fascia release because we're going to address the first ray, but you don't know how much you have to dorsiflex that first ray until you release your plantar fascia. Then you can come and add your, your uh, first toe Jones, do your metatarsal osteotomy to bring that up. You do that in conjunction. So our first step is always release the plantar fascia, and I tend to do it right through the mid-substance of the plantar fascia. Uh, rather than going off the heel, I'm away from the nerves. I don't have to worry about getting any kind of nerve injury postoperatively. And then once you do that, then you can figure out your osteotomy of your first metatarsal. Um, these are easy to fix now. We use mostly the, the uh, spring-loaded staples. Uh, it makes it very simple. You want to make sure your first cut is proximal to, is parallel to the joint so you don't uh, mess up the joint. And then you can make your distal cut, bring it up, and put the staples in. And essentially what you're doing is you want to get this straight. It's sitting in this position. So you're going to take a wedge out, and you can free, pre figure out how big a wedge you need in order to bring that up so that you get this ray back in the position that you want it to end up in. Um, We'll transfer the EHL to the neck of the metatarsal, do our IP fusion to correct that problem there as well. And then sometimes you have to do a capsulotomy in order to get that to occur. Um, so simply, it's you know, kind of straightforward. You're going to isolate that long sensor tendon. Um, you're going to release it distally to address your IP joint, pull it back into the neck, uh, and just transfer it through into the neck of the metatarsal. Uh, there's different ways to do it. You can go through and through um, from medial to lateral, or you can put a, a, a suture anchor and interference screw in. And then you're going to determine you know, how much of an osteotomy you need to do uh, approximately. So this is just you know, one technique of doing it with a suture anchor. Uh, it's certainly more expensive than doing it with a through and through. So, uh, the price of the suture anchor, you'll be surprised, is sometimes as high as $700. So oftentimes, I'll just go through and through instead. But the concept is the same. So we've released our plantar fascia. We're next going to address that, uh, do our dorsiflexion osteotomy, and then do our first toe Jones. Um, this is what it ends up looking like, uh, and then you can get your correction. This is through the, the tunnel if you want to go this way. You then got to go back and address the hind foot, and we're going to generally do that through a Dwyer calcaneal osteotomy. And with this osteotomy, you can move the, you can correct the varus, but you can also elevate the heel if you have to. So you can not only correct the varus, but you can increase the ca increase calcaneal pitch by making your cut. So you can figure out how much of a wedge you need to do uh, to get that heel out of varus. Uh, and then one, before you close that osteotomy site, you can raise that heel up 
to correct the calcaneal pitch as well. So you can do a combination of correcting in both of these planes and get that displacement to again address the hind foot component of it. So you start out with a cavus foot like this. You can see it's uh, hind foot and forefoot driven. Release your plantar fascia, get Miri's angle back, do your calcaneal osteotomy, and same in this example here. And you can get the foot plantigrade, and that's really your goal. Well, what if they're rigid? If they're rigid, it becomes a little more difficult, and it depends on how fixed and how bad their deformity is. Uh, a lot of times, you can just loosen up the joints, um, do a standard triple arthrodesis if there's not a lot of hind foot deformity and bony deformity. Problem is, in some of these diseases, this started out when they, when the, when they were younger patients, and they have associated bone deformity, and it could be very severe. And then you have to think about doing a Lamborghini or a Seifert, where basically you're cutting wedges out and by cutting out the wedges, you're gaining your correction. So you can do a wedge at the subtalar joint, calcaneal cuboid joint, and you're going to offset and plantar flex that through the talonavicular joint to essentially accomplish a, compos a composite like this to get things reduced uh, and get that cavus deformity back. So you have a four-foot deformity like this. It's extremely rigid, so you've got to create that valgus uh, of your heel to get it out of varus. So you're doing a wedge through the subtalar joint in this plane, but you're also doing a wedge in this plane at all. So they're biplanar osteotomies that you're creating. Uh, in order to get your correction, and your goal is to go from this position to that position. Um, so you can calculate this out. This is where standing, I think the weight-bearing CTs are very helpful in helping you do uh, correct this. Um, and you also have to remember that if you correct the hind foot, you have to correct the forefoot, because otherwise you're going to ruin your ankle uh, completely. So you have to do both uh, and assess them for ankle instability. If there's severe ankle instability and ankle arthritis associated with this, I uh, will usually move to a TTC fusion. And in those situations, they're usually the neuromusters like the advanced CMTs that really have no perineal anterior tibial strength. So doing a TTC fusion actually helps to address it. So these are different examples of how you can do this one through more of a standard triple. This is a very old case in mind when we're still using staples. We don't do it anymore. But really the goal is to take the foot from that position, end up in this position so you get things corrected. And so when they're walking, you're getting rid of that varus, which Would ultimately is going to destroy their ankle time. and get them into the position where now they're walking like this where your foot is flat and plantigrade. And that way you're preserving their ankle. And that's okay, really the key okay. in these cavus feet. When they get severe, if you don't get them corrected, you're going to ruin the ankle. So if it's a rigid deformity with a severe ankle deformity like this, uh, the ankle's already gone. You've kind of lost the game here. And I think in these situations, you're much better off doing a TTC fusion, going to the nail, getting them plantar grade, uh, and essentially helping. So in summary, the forefoot can drive it as well as the hind foot. You cannot do these in isolation. You have to address the whole foot. Coleman block test is very helpful. You use a combination of osteotomies, arthrodesis, soft tissue releases, and tendon transfers. You always want to end up with a balanced foot, both in the hind foot as well as the forefoot. I personally think these are a lot of fun to do. Uh, there's a lot of thinking and planning when you go ahead in, in evaluating them. And you know, on your exam, look for neuropathy, look for muscle weaknesses. They can be caused by you have a cavus foot, it could be CMT, it could be polio, any of these problems that can cause it. And you have to figure out how to balance the muscles at the end. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.